This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast with Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here bringing another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hey, glad to have you on board. I hope you've had a great week. Uh, I certainly had a pretty productive week. I've been able to get out there and do some uh, field research using the uh, Burrow RX uh, fumigation device. It's a carbon monoxide generator. That's what I call them. Uh, And I was testing it out on Richardson ground squirrels, trying to get a handle on how long of an injection time do we need to have in order to get an effective kill of Richardson ground squirrels in their burrows? So you, some of you uh, may have known that I mentioned, I believe, about my use with it with prairie dogs. And uh, my research uh, found that a, a three-minute injection time typically was enough to take out prairie dogs. Uh, so at about a 90% level. And uh, so that was pretty impressive and now I've been doing it with Richardson ground squirrels Um, a little bit more difficult so uh, but anyways I'll probably have a pod a podcast on that in the future where I'll discuss some of my findings because I am I just did my first check today and I got two more days to go so we'll see how what the results are Uh, so yeah I'll be checking my flags uh, flagged holes on Sunday and so we will see what what happens there so but a pretty productive week and also i've been involved with a publication a manual update and so i'm kind of excited about that trying to get that uh, moving as well so anyways today here i'm sure many of you are now in the thick of your busy season particularly those of you living in the northern latitudes of the united states Uh, and likely the world. Uh, So this is certainly spring in the Northern Hemisphere. And for those of you who are in the Southern Hemisphere who happen to be listening, well, things may be getting settled down in your area. Maybe this is your quiet time. But nevertheless, I hope this particular podcast is going to be useful to me to you. Uh, Do take a few moments, if you will, and subscribe to the channel. Uh, We would love to have that. Make sure you uh, give us a like and click the stars a five-star review would be really helpful for us as well as if you have comments and suggestions for future shows definitely reach out to me at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com that's wildlife control consultant at gmail.com i would love to hear from you your suggestions thoughts ideas and yes even criticisms if you have those love to hear from you all right this week i wanted to talk a little bit about carcass disposal Now, this is something that's certainly a topic that many people haven't properly discussed or dealt with. Uh, Certainly, there's going to be more to talk about than what I'm going to discuss today, but I wanted to be sure you got uh, this thought about because it is a significant issue. And so let me uh, bring us up to a particular uh, website here. Here is the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. This is the agency within the United States that governs a variety of laws governing the environment, particularly pesticide use. And it talks, has a page here about carcass management because when when you think about it, the kinds of numbers that wildlife control operators deal with can be rather significant. So certainly it's gonna take a while to for us to reach the level of a cow, for instance, a cow that may weigh a thousand pounds or 800 pounds or so, that, that's a lot on the hoof, right? So, or a horse, that's gonna be a lot. So it's gonna take a while for us to get there, but nevertheless, uh, wildlife control operators, if you're dispatching your animals, and by the way, some states do require that, many, some states do f- prohibit the translocation of wildlife. Now I know that Sometimes the less uh, ethical wildlife control operators out there just simply dump animals down the road. Um, and that is certainly a topic for another, another presentation. Uh, certainly I would disagree with that. Under no circumstances should 
wildlife control operators be violating the law. However, I do think in this situation, many sometimes wildlife control operators when it comes to carcass disposal are not getting uh, properly educated because the government frankly has done a rather poor job on talking about carcass disposal. And because they still treat wildlife control as a subset of the fur trade. And it assumes that trappers are simply going to dispose of their animals out in the woods, away from human habitation. But wildlife control, as you know, involves humans. We're, pri we're primarily involved with human activity. A lot of you are going to be in heavily urbanized areas. And so what are you going to do with these carcasses, right? So you've dispatched the animal. Now what are you going to do with the body? So this particular page talks about how to manage carcasses of basically non-diseased animal. Now this page is related to COVID-19. I'm not going to be talking about COVID-19. It's not the subject of this particular presentation. But what I liked about this particular page is it talked about the pros and cons of the various methods of carcass disposal. And I thought I would use this particular outline to sort of give you a quick review of some of your options. And some of them I frankly haven't heard before. But uh, that's always trying to learn something new in this particular business. So why don't we scroll down and take that. So the, they begin with who oversees carcass management. And it talks about APHIS. That's the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. It's a division within the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And it's basically dealing with a lot of times of uh, large-scale foreign animal disease outbreaks, including depopulation. So USDA is the agency involved. If there's ever like a foreign disease issue that can enter the United States and it threatens our animal populations, then they will gear up and they will probably call wildlife services because they have people that have to be available to get on the plane within 24 hours of being called and they would be involved in sort of a disease management act and part of that would be depopulation where they would literally kill thousands of animals or oversee the death of thousands of animals some of you may have heard of this sort of activity occurring often in china or, or the southeast where there'll be a virus outbreak that hits chickens and you'll hear of them killing all the chickens in a massive area and so or they'll kill pigs or whatever the case may be and so you have these massive depopulations that are occurring to try to stop the transmission of this virus or disease from being able to jump both to other animals or even worse still jumping to the human population again that's something that's really kind of beyond the scale of what we're doing here in the wildlife control but it's something you may want to read and learn more about and so now what the epa does here is they talk about what are some of the livestock carcass management options for non-diseased animals now i noticed that little caveat there non-diseased animals sometimes in wildlife control we're dealing with diseased animals and so that kind of puts a little sticky wicket in the situation and as well, you think about a raccoon, you know, is, is a raccoon, which typically would have raccoon roundworm, but does that constitute a disease? Or is it something that's going to be more threatening to humans, maybe such as rabies, for instance? I, I don't know the answer to that, right? So these are some things that can certainly be concerning. But nevertheless, we don't want to make the perfect the enemy of the good. If you don't have a plan for how you're going to be handling your carcasses, then it doesn't matter whether you're dealing with diseased or not because you're not doing it right probably now anyways, regardless of whether it's diseased or not. At least that would be my approach. So this is going to be sort of an ongoing conversation. This is I'm hoping you're going to reach out to your government officials. And I just want to caution you that they're, they're, they may not have the answers you want to have or they're going to tell you answers you don't want to hear, especially for those of you that are living in urbanized areas where you you know, you maybe don't have access to a crematorium or the crematorium's too expensive for you to use. Uh, you may have to be using things like uh, uh, solid waste disposal facilities and they may just say no, but let's talk about that a little bit later here. So they talk about the tier one rankings. And so you look in the left-hand column and so these are the procedures for carcass disposal 
that the EPA likes the best is my reading of it. So it says rank one, negligible to minimal exposure releases of regulated to safe levels for human health and the environment. So it really likes this first group of management options for carcasses. And so the first one is alkaline hydrolysis. I have never heard of that particular option before. I'm assuming this is sort of like a lime, uh, uh, a quick and, uh, quick lime that's used to decay bodies. Uh, but I don't, I don't know that for a fact. It just, uh, so I haven't used it. So basically what it says here is that the tightly contained gases uses hot sodium hydroxide, significant reduction of solid volume. So it just basically, I guess, eats the carcass up. Relatively fast destruction of carcasses and of course extremely limited for capacity for a mass mortality situation. So if you're dealing with a lot of animals, this is probably not going to be the way to go. But I think this might be something for wildlife control operators to consider if you have uh, access to disposal of the liquid waste. Of course, I'm assuming that many of you would not because you don't want to be putting this stuff down the sewer. Okay. So you need to have a plan for the remnants of what you've just decayed with this alkaline hydrolysis. So probably not going to be something that we're going to be able to use. Uh, what's the second option? Well, the second option is going to be, let me kind of blow this up a little bit for you so you can see it a little bit easier. Uh, incineration in a fixed facility. This would be a going to a crematorium, you know, probably one that's run by a veterinarian. Uh, you do have the option to purchase one yourself, but then you have to deal with all of the air quality concern issues. That may not be a problem for some of you that live out into the West, uh, but I would suspect, and I don't know this for certain, but I would suspect if you're living in a state that's testing vehicles for their exhaust, it's probably going to be hard for you to get a license for one of these fixed crematoriums, and it may not be profitable for you to do it. However, you, if you think you can become the go-to place for a lot of your other business, if you maybe have a fair number of wildlife control operators in the area, uh, you may be able to make a go of it. Or if you had the ability to uh, cremate people's pets, some people are really into their pets, and so this would be an opportunity for them to keep Fifi around forever, sort of in an urn. That can be another option for you of make, in terms of making money. This is something you would certainly need to explore. But incineration in a fixed facility is an option. Notice it says air emissions are regulated under the Clean Air Act. Pollution control equipment can include scrubbers, fabric filters, residuals. That means the ash are managed under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Discharges of wastewater to waters of the United States are managed under the Clean Water Act. So you can see there's additional regulations there. Tightly regulated facilities, they're safe, it does reduce the volume, it is efficient and readily implemented. However, the downside is limited local capacity depending on location, difficult to process large whole animals. Of course, they're talking about cattle here, typically not a problem for wildlife control operators, but if you're dealing with things like deer removal, deer carcass removal, this may become an issue. Uh, you have off-site non-hazmat transport. People got to transport this material to you. Limited availability, limited throughput, and requires packaging. So those are some of the downsides of incineration. How about just dropping the carcass in a landfill? Well, uh, landfill design and operation are regulated under the RCRA rules. Let me see what that is. That's the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, again, I'm learning some new acronyms here, and controls including leachate, that's uh, when, you know, when it rains or there's liquids inside the landfill, they have to figure out how to prevent that from getting down to the groundwater. And methane recovery, that's also an issue because methane is, is a called a greenhouse gas, not getting involved in the greenhouse gas controversy, just going through here with the EPA, what some of their concerns are and issues. And of course, landfill air emissions are regulated under the Clean Air Act and requirements include gas collection and control system, installation and operation. Okay, but you don't have to worry about that. That would be worried, that would have to be taken care of by the municipality that is managing that particular landfill. Okay, but that's certainly so 
What are some of the benefits of it? Tightly regulated, there's leachate control, it's safe, it's high capacity, quickly and readily imp implemented and sufficient. Absolutely, just dump here. However, there are potential concerns for these carcasses. There's it permitting issues, there's related to accepting large quantities of carcasses. Again, I don't think that's gonna be a major issue for those of you in the wildlife control field. When I was in business, I was full-time. Of course, I wasn't as big as some of you guys out there now. However, uh, you know, I would take the carcasses, I'd put them in a freezer and, you know, then double bag them, put them in a freezer and then bring them up. You know, when I got a, basically a barrel full, I would bring them up to the crematorium and that would be about 50 pounds or so. Uh, maybe more and then they would simply cremate them for me and I had to pay uh, 50 cents a pound at that time so it could be a little pricey uh, I didn't use a, a landfill I probably should have looked at going into a landfill but I think our landfill was beginning to get closed in, uh, during that time for the Springfield area but that's a long time ago uh, anyways, off-site, there's also potential denial of use by facilities. So you do need to give your facilities a heads up and say, hey, I'd like to like to bring some carcasses here on a regular basis. Is that something that I can do? And my suggestion to you is if they give you a hard time or they tell you no, then you need to basically ask them, well, then are you refusing all the steak throwaways and other meats that are peop that are being tossed in the garbage as well. I mean, you think of a city of, let's say, 100,000 people. I mean, that's a lot of meat scraps going, getting tossed into the garbage can. And ask them, why, why is it a problem for you to bring in 50 pounds of animal carcasses? That's something definitely for you to discuss with them and say, is it really reasonable? Personally, I don't think it is. However, maybe they have an argument that I haven't considered yet. So it might be something for you to think about. Uh, how about rendering? I don't think rendering is really going to be a good idea for those of us in the wildlife control field simply because we are dealing with animals that aren't getting uh, antibiotics, they're not being dewormed, uh, and I'm not convinced, I'm not exactly sure, maybe I should say this, is that whether rendering would make those rendered products sterile. Uh, so I'm not sure this is really an option for those of us in this particular industry. Um, but it's something, you know, if you want to make some raccoon tallow for raccoon candles or something, I guess you could probably try something like that. Uh, you would just have to be sure you're following whatever wildlife laws in your particular area. Because some states, for example, my home state of Massachusetts, it prohibited any in use of any part of the animal that was controlled outside of its sporting season. So if I caught a raccoon in the middle of the summer, I was not allowed to use any part of that animal. I had to wait till November 1st uh, to capture an animal during that time because that's when the trapping season was occurred. So uh, I understand the rationale for that type of restriction. However, I did think that it was unfortunate that we wasted so much animals, for example, uh, skunk essence, when you're looking at a product that uh, last I heard, it was getting $15 an ounce or so, uh, maybe more because I think not enough people are extracting that. Uh, that's a lot, that can be a lot of money when you think that a, a mature skunk may be able to give you $15, a full ounce of uh, its essence and it's used of course in the lure industry. Uh, I think it's really sad to that we're throwing that all away when we're considering the value of that. So you're figuring, you know, you may say, well, that's, what's the big deal, Stephen? 15 bucks, it's not worth it for me. Well, uh, my suggestion to you is if you think about how that can be really valuable for you, and that could be, you know, that could be dinner money. Think about, you know, four or five skunks and you're, you know, you have enough for at least a low, a low end meal with you and your spouse. And that's certainly something uh, not to sneeze at. The other option that the EPA discusses, of course, is above ground burial. And so this is basically just taking the carcass and dropping it on the surface of the ground and letting nature take its course. And one of the benefits of above ground burial is it is an incredibly uh, environmentally sound, provided you don't have an over concentration of animals on the surface of the ground. 
So it's partially controlled. It releases minor leaching and runoff, releases gas to the air, may have a low spot where carcass has been decomposed, which is of course true. However, the benefits of it are if implemented correctly, it's likely safe. Like for example, on a farm, it's quickly and readily implemented. It's safe. It doesn't require any heavy digging less impact to groundwater than below grade conventional burial. Why? Because it's on the surface. And a lot of times you'll have plants that can capture a lot of these nutrients before it ever even gets into the groundwater. So, and it can be broken down, not to mention scavengers may grab this. Of course, they see that as a negative. Of course, for us, that would be a positive because it would mean that a lot of that material is being consumed before it even leaches into the soil. Because car yeah, scavengers can find carcasses relatively quickly, particularly during the summer months when it's warm and the uh, carcass is beginning to be odorous. Of course, in the winter time, that would obviously be a much slower. Now, the negatives, of course, are uh, potential public health risk. People are letting walking their dogs through the woods. They're often trespassing. It could become an issue when it comes to public relations PR. So that is clearly an issue. Uh, and you would never want to put an, an animal on the surface of the ground if you had any suspicion like that it was rabid or it was just maybe it had distemper. Uh, you just were just felt a little funny about it. I know that's not very scientific, but a lot of us don't have the capability of testing animals for disease. But if you had suspicion that an animal was sick, you, this is not the thing to be doing. And so that's certainly something you should not be doing. What's the next option? Air curtain burning. It's sort of a, you know, it's kind of like a incineration. Again, the air emissions are regulated under the Clean Air Act. And of course, you also have to ma manage the combustion ash. Uh, it significantly reduces air emissions compared to open burning. Open burning, you're just throwing the carcass on a pot, on a, on a pile of uh, a pyre of uh, a fire, for example. And of course, it reduces volume, but it requires significant quantities of solid fuel or ash minimal um, ash management requirements there is the potential to human health risk it's inefficient requires a skilled operator now we're getting down into the uh, let me uh, scroll down here so let's this let me be clear I, I I spoke a little too soon now we're moving into the second tier options what the EPA considers the second tier I've already mentioned above ground burial the EPA considers that a second tier option not a first tier option however I think for wildlife control operators if you have a remote enough area this is probably clearly going to be something that's going to be a potential for you air curtain burning is a second tier option i've already mentioned that and of course below grade conventional burial is another rank two or second tier option one of the negatives is uncontrolled leaching from an unlined burial because we don't line our burials right it's not like a crypt you're not putting the carcasses in a crypt uh, it is relatively inexpensive and very easy to implement that's those are certainly positives however there are some negatives that is potential for groundwater contamination. And you need to be thinking about when you're putting things into burial, where is the well? Where is the closest water source? Where, uh, how, how deep is the water table? And so you need to be thinking about this because you have to go deep enough so that scavengers aren't taking it up, but not so deep that you're, you know, getting down into the groundwater, right? So, it may limit future land use. So if you're dumping it in an area and all of a sudden the landowner wants to sell the land, you know, three months later, is all that material gonna be decomposed or when they're putting in a foundation? Or is, is basically, you know, this pet cemetery gonna be gonna come up and you don't think that's gonna come back and blow back on you? Well, you bet, better believe it probably will, but people will be searching for it and, and they'll probably track it back to you. So you need to be careful about things like that. Composting is an option. Uh, so this is certainly done by certain tr uh, highway transportation areas when they're picking up uh, carcasses of deer, for instance, they will pile these deer up and create enough composition material so that the bacteria will uh, consume them. And so there are some issues, of course, with it, but if, they're, if it's implemented correctly, according to the EPA, there's min minimal leachate, minimal odor, 
and the compost can be used as a soil amendment. I Again, I would be very concerned about using it as a soil amendment. Anywhere where people are going to be eating food, I'd be quite nervous about that. Um, however, you can certainly do some more research on that should you, should you wish to. Uh, it does require significant quantities of carbon sources, such as wood chips or corn stover, significant space requirements, because again, you've got to pile all this up and create enough heat so those microbes are continuing to eat their way through these carcasses. And they will do this even in the wintertime as well if you get enough critical mass going there. And there are, tr there are training materials that teach you how to do this. And then, of course, you've got to, you know, be moving these carcasses around in order to get the right facilities to do this. It needs on-site supervision. There's temporary, temporary restrictions on land use is certainly a problem. Uh, we mentioned earlier open burning. These are they're sort of pyres, they're called. Uh, again, high, uncontrolled, unregulated combustion. You're basically just putting the animal carcass on a fire. Uh, it can be an issue, especially for those of you who are in uh, fire zones. You know, out here in the West, we have uh, long periods of time when there are no open fires allowed, and that can be a significant problem. Uh, relatively simple to use, of course, but of course, yes, but then the negatives are it requires significant quantities of solid fuel because you've got to create enough heat to keep that fire going because you think of all the fat and the juices on those animals are going to help put that fire out until you get a high enough temperature to turn that fat into fuel. It's not sustainable for ongoing large volume disposal. That's probably true. It's but and there's potential for public opposition. So again, it's not something you're going to be doing in downtown New York, right? So those of you in heavily urbanized areas, this is not really going to be an option for you. Uh, so and it may be regulatory limited. The rest of this particular page is going to talk about some of the concerns about environmental uh, environmental concerns regarding carcass management and are there facilities that can help you with carcass uh, management. And there's another link for you here. So that's clearly pretty important in that regard. Uh, a lot of a lot of technical information there, but this basically gave you a bird's eye view of some of your options. And it's going to be important for you to think about what options are actually going to work for you. You know, one of the things that wasn't mentioned in this, but it would sort of be along the lines of using your local landfill, and that is call your trash company and say, hey, I'm a wildlife control operator, and I would probably want to talk to someone in upper management, maybe even making a personal visit and say, look, I've got some animals I need to have disposed of. I can have them frozen. I can put them in a separate trash can and make sure that they're going out in the morning of the day of trash pickup. Uh, can you handle this for me? And you're gonna be using relatively small quantities, you know, 40 pounds, 50 pounds of animals, because your trash is typically picked up every week. So, I mean, how many animals are you gonna be are you going to be capturing, especially with more of you using one-way doors? Uh, this particular issue is certainly going to be going uh, going away or reducing for many of you. I did want to point out a publication uh, for you to look at to learn more. Uh, USDA technical uh, bulletins. Let's see if that's going to work for me. Uh, let me do the wildlife. Let's see if this pulls it up for me. Nope, that's not it. Okay, let's go with Here we go, the Wildlife Damage Management Technical Series. Those of you who are familiar with the Prevention and Control of Wildlife Damage, that was published originally in 1994. It's two major volumes of three ring bound material. Some of you may have it in a PDF form. It's available online. It's getting a bit dated now in 1994. It still has some substantive use, however. 
Uh, there was a move to make a version five because the, the Prevention Control of Wildlife Damage 1994 was the fourth edition. And so there was work being done to create edition five. Unfortunately, uh, it didn't get completed. So a lot of us who had written articles or chapters for the revised edition have found a place to publish our material and that has been published here by the USDA Wildlife Services in their technical wildlife damage technical bulletin series. And so these, think of this as sort of the updates of, of certain chapters, but also the goal was to make the fifth edition even broader to cover more topics that were neglected in the 1994 edition. So you can see here, there's a lot of bird material, and of course, there's a lot of mammal material, but if you go down to the bottom, you'll notice a publication here, Wildlife Carcass Disposal. And this is one that I helped co-author with Mark King, who was part of the main Department of Environmental Protection. And so this particular publication, it was published a couple of years ago, actually. And so it basically kind of summarizes how to handle wildlife carcass disposal uh, in a manner that's going to be suitable for those of us in the wildlife control field. And so it's not dealing with a cow, for instance, right? And, not, and it, probably the biggest animal we're talking about is probably going to be a deer. Um, of course, you probably don't think of a moose, perhaps, but a moose is pretty rare. Most of us aren't going to be handling a moose. But it goes through some of the issues involved about handling carcasses safely and disposal methods that are gonna be kind of suitable for those of us in the wildlife control field. And so this may be a document that you may want to uh, investigate and just tidy up your own carcass disposal because think about it, there is a liability with your dealing with the carcass. And so when you're dealing with the carcass, what happens if someone gets exposed to an animal that's rabid? You know, that rabies virus can stay viable for several days, even when the animal becomes putrefied. How about uh, something I learned recently, uh, heard about, and that is uh, a, a boy was working on a, excuse me, not a boy, or rather it was a nine-year-old boy who was who went to one of these places and purchased uh, a rattlesnake head and pricked his finger with one of the fangs and there was still venom in it. Now, you would, who would have thought? I, I wouldn't think of that if you go to a, a, a store, one of these you know, uh, souvenir type stores and it has the rattlesnake there with its fangs out. And, you know, you cut yourself with the fang and there might be still a venom in it. Uh, you would like, really? Another individual was mounting. He was sort of preparing uh, a rattlesnake head. He froze it for three months and then pulled it out and then, you know, thawed it. And then he soaked it in the saltwater solution for three days and then put it into another uh, fixative for another day or so and he, he was working with it working with it and he got pricked and he got envenomated uh, who would have thought right you think it would have been diluted with all those uh, solutions so think about situations that you're being involved with here when you have these carcasses there could be some legal liability for you. Again, discuss this perhaps with, a, with your lawyer, but you, and plus not to mention just the PR situation. So this publication may help you and guide you in terms of what you're gonna be doing. And of course, this is not the end all and be all. You always need to check your local regulations, whatever nation you're with. Um, but unfortunately, this is something where, to get on one of my hobby horses again, why we as a wildlife control industry need to be lobbying our state officials to get some of these things clarified. And yeah, I understand that takes risk because when you bring an issue up, you make it regulation you're not wanting to handle. I totally understand that. But part of that is a function of the lack of power within our industry. And so this is something we desperately need to consider. Well, I've covered a lot there. Again, this was an overview. I'll probably maybe down the road do some deep dives on these specific, uh, some of these specific methods and try to come back with some more information, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Again, I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Do take a few moments, if you would, drop me a line at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you and your comments. Again, understand that I do 
uh, do some consulting work, of course. I do some draft writing. I do help people with manuals. Uh, if you have some copy editing that you'd like to have done, perhaps you have a book in your own heart that you'd like to get put out there, uh, I could happy to help you. I can help you organize your images and work with you and even put in your uh, tra uh, copyright marks on your images so that it's harder for people to steal them, use them without your permission. It can watermark them for you as well and, and help you with that. So reach out to me again, Wildlife Control Consultant, at gmail.com and then of course i have several books available you can see those at my website at wildlifecontrolconsultant.com and you've been listening to living the wildlife why do we call it living the wildlife because we want you to live the wildlife not be the wildlife take care everybody <laughs>